Hi everybody and welcome! In today's video we're going to look at the sound generation problem with deep learning. Specifically, we're going to lay out the foundations that we'll use throughout the series for building a sound generation uh, system. What I want to do in this video is taking a look at the different approaches that are available, also talk about the challenges that we'll face and give you a set of tools that you can use to classify different types of sound generation systems. But let's get started with the problem itself. So what's the sound generation task? Well, I'm quite sure you're familiar with this, but in a nutshell, what we do is we take a bunch of like sound or like audio files, we fit it to a network and with our magic wand, we can then generate other sound. So in this problem or in this task, we have two clearly separate steps. The first one is that of training. And here we have a bunch of sounds that we feed into a black box deep learning uh, model. And then once we've trained the model, the next thing we can do is the funny part. In other words, like generate a new sound. Okay, but how can we classify different sound generation systems? Well, we don't have like a, an official taxonomy, but these are some questions that I ask in order to understand like the different uh, models or systems I'm working with. So let's go and review each of these questions one by one. First one, what types of sounds are generated? Second, what are the features used to train the system? Or in other words, what sound representation do we use to train the system? Then the third one is interested in the deep learning architectures that we use. In other words, what is the DL architecture employed? And finally, we should also ask ourselves, what are the inputs that we give to the model to generate uh, sound? Okay, in the remaining part of this video, I'm gonna analyze each of these question in depth in isolation. So let's get started with the first one, which is the types of sounds generated. And here you see like the most relevant ones. One of course is speech. We can generate speech. And a flavor of that is the famous text to speech uh, problem where you have uh, some text and you want to vocalize that with a speech synthesis uh, algorithm. Then we have music, or in other words, like music generation, but the output of that is already sound. And this is like something that we can do like in different styles for different in different artist style as well, or in different moods. And the third point is again connected to music and it's basically generating music notes or what music productions like to call uh, audio samples or um, music samples. And these are like single notes that you can use like to when packaged together to create a, a virtual instrument. And the fourth point here is sound design. Think of the sound of a rain or the sound of a door slamming, right? So you can create all of this sound design, sound effects uh, using generative uh, systems. Cool, there are a bunch of other uh, options here, but I'm not gonna get into those because here we have like the most important ones. Okay, so now let's move on to the second step, which I think like is the most interesting one. And it's basically the features that we use to train these generative models. And we can think of this like also like as different types of sound representations we can use to uh, train the model. And here we have mainly two. One is row audio, the other one is spectrograms. Now let's take a look at each of these in detail. So, this is like your typical high level diagram of generation from raw audio. Here you have a system that's an end to end system. So you have uh, some raw audio, which is basically a waveform or an audio, audio file, if you will. You fit it into a network and you train the network with that. And then on the other end of the network, you get some other raw audio or sound. Now, as you see here, there's no pre-processing or post-processing. The whole system is end-to-end. -end. Cool. Now, 
Uh, there are a bunch of uh, systems that generate sound directly from raw audio. And here I want to mention a couple of like relevant ones. One is WaveNet. I'm quite sure you may be familiar with this. And this system, which I think was published in 2016, uh, is capable of generating speech and it's also been used for generating uh, music. Then we have Jukebox over here. This is an amazing piece of research that's been uh, published, I think, earlier this year in 2020. And it, it is a system that is focused on generating uh, music directly from rare audio. If you want to learn more about this uh, two uh, papers, I highly suggest you to check them out because they are really interesting and good. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, raw audio. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, we basically are talking about the uh, waveform here, the sound wave, if you will. And uh, now here, if we zoom into like a waveform, what we see is something like this, right? So where we have like time on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have amplitude and the, the the kind of like signal that we get is a discrete signal so we're going to have like certain points at discrete points in time that are like the the sample points and here uh, the interesting thing is that if you think about like this um, a waveform as a whole basically a time series. It, it's a sequence. So you have a lot of data points, but how many data points you really have here? Well, a lot. So rare audio is very heavy. For one second worth of audio in a CD, for example, you're going to need to have 44,000.1 uh, samples, right? Or I should say 44.1k uh, samples. It's a lot of data and that's only for one second worth of audio. Now, obviously I'm not going to get into the details of waveforms and all of that, but I highly suggest you to go check out this video if you're not familiar with audio signals. Okay, but what do we learn uh, like, uh, about like this little intro into waveform? Is that what we learn is that we need a lot of data to describe uh, audio, raw audio. And so when we train our models with raw audio, what happens is this. So uh, audio is very, very heavy. And this has like some disadvantages. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that we face when we uh, try to uh, train uh, generative systems directly from rare audio. First of all, it is very difficult to capture long range dependencies. Two questions here. What are long range dependencies? And two, why is it difficult to capture those? Well, long range dependencies are different elements, different structures and perceptual structures that we extract from audio signals. And these can be at different levels of resolution, pitch, rhythm, harmony, if we're talking about a music signal, timbre, words, melody, structure. So in order to uh, capture like this long range uh, dependencies, well, you need to have like a very, very complex uh, uh, model. And this is not <clears throat> always possible. Actually, it's not really like a, pro a solved problem, this one, in the raw audio domain. And the reason why that's the case is once again, because like we have a ton of data. So imagine that for a single sound, we have more than 40,000 like data points. So like these sequences are enormous. So capturing the patterns that repeat there uh, it's quite difficult. Uh, to give you like a comparison here, think of long short term memory networks. These can learn patterns that have up to like a few hundred data points at most. Now, for only one second worth of audio, you have more than 40,000 uh, data points. So as you see, like this is like a really problematic thing to do. Now, given that we have all of this heavy data, what happens is that training a uh, generative model that uses raw audio is very computational expensive. 
And that's in terms of like the computational resources and the GPUs that you have to use. But at the same time, also like your models need to be like very complex with uh, a lot of parameters. Cool. What the sense from that is that the generation itself and the training are really slow. We can take WaveNet uh, as an example. So WaveNet is amazing. It can create like some really interesting like, results in speech and in music generation, but it takes a lot of time to generate. And that's again, because I mean, raw audio is heavy. Okay, now that we know the problem, is there a way of solving this problem? Yes, we can use a more compact representation of sound. And this one, is most of the time spectrograms. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of spectrograms like once again, because I have a whole series on audio uh, signal processing for machine learning. But if you want to learn at least a little bit more about spectrograms, I highly suggest you to go check out this video. But I'll give you really like a one minute uh, like rundown on spectrograms. Here we have like, um, we take like a waveform and we transform it into the so-called time frequency domain. And on the x-axis we have time, we have like discrete points in time. And on the y-axis we have like different frequency bins. And this you can think of as a grid. Each point of this grid, it tells us how much energy we have at a specific frequency bin at a certain point in time. So you can read a spectrogram as a heat map in the end. So, and the color tells you how present a certain frequency is. The brighter the color in this case in particular, and the more energy you have in that specific frequency band. Okay, so we can use spectrograms to uh, train um, generative uh, sound models and to generate audio. Okay, but let's try to understand the workflow that we use for uh, generative sound systems that use spectrograms. As I said, we start always from the waveform, but at this point we have a pre-processing step. In other words, what we do is we apply the short time Fourier transform to uh, the waveform, which is in the time domain, so that we get a spectrogram, which is in the time frequency domain. Then after that, what we do is we train the model, but not using the audio, but rather using the spectrograms. So these transformations are of the original audio. So once we have the uh, model, that's been trained, the next step is we're ready for generation. And indeed, what we do is we generate, but we don't generate directly raw audio. What we generate is spectrograms, right? The stuff we trained the model on. But unfortunately, as human beings, we can't really listen to spectrograms. So we need a final step, which is a post-processing step. Uh, that involves the so-called inverse short time uh, Fourier transform. And what we do with this is we start from a spectrogram and we reconstruct a waveform out of the original spectrogram. Okay, so as you can see, um, by using spectrograms instead of um, a raw audio, what happens is that we now have to add extra steps so that the model is not necessarily end-to-end -end right now, but rather we need pre-processing and post-processing steps. Okay, but now what I want to say here is that uh, I've, uh, I've used like the term spectrogram, but there are a lot of different types of uh, spectrograms or spectrogram flavors, as I wrote here. We have like the vanilla spectrogram, which are like the ones that I showed you earlier. Then we have like log amplitude spectrograms when where we apply a log transformation to the amplitude. We have log frequency amplitude spectrograms. We have male spectrograms. We have magnitude power spectrograms. Now, uh, the only one that I want to touch upon a little bit is male spectrograms. And the idea here is that we transform the frequency axis in a way that's perceptually relevant for us human beings. Now, I don't want to bother with all the complexity that comes with spectrograms. Again, if you want to learn more about that, I have a whole series on 
audio digital signal processing for machine learning and I highly suggest you to go check out that one there. Okay, but I'm sure you may have a lot of doubts if you're not familiar with digital signal processing and AI audio. So how can you like, get feedback? How can you get like, suggestions? Well, hopefully or luckily, I should say, there's a whole community, the Sound of AI Slack group, where we have a lot of people interested in AI music, AI audio, signal processing. And here you can post your doubts, you can ask for feedback. So I highly suggest you to join the community if you haven't done so. If you do want to join the community, please check the, 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 the sign up link in the description box below. Okay, now back to the cool stuff. So we also have a bunch of different um, systems that uh, have been de developed over time for generating sound using spectrograms. So here I'm just mentioning a couple of this that I find really interesting. So one is called Melnet and it uses Mel spectrograms for generating speech and music. And this other one here on the right hand side is called a drum gun. And here uh, the researchers used um, spectrograms for synthesizing drum sounds. Again, if you want to know more about how like these researchers have done uh, this, just like go check out these uh, papers. What are the advantages of using spectrograms for generation? Well, the most important one is that the temporal axis of a spectrogram is more compact than that of a waveform. In other words, we can uh, have like this. What are the advantages of generating sound using spectrograms? Well, I think like the first point here is probably the most important one. In other words, the temporal axis of spectrogram is more compact than that of waveform. What this means is that for a given interval of time, we are gonna need way less data points on a spectrogram than we need in a waveform. And that's because the interval between two adjacent uh, points in a spectrogram has uh, a time interval that's way, way larger than the equivalent that we have between two adjacent points in a waveform. Okay, so now if we can pack a lot more information with uh, less data points, what this means is that we can, using spectrograms, we can use, we can capture longer time dependencies. And again, that's because for the same a time interval with spectrograms, we need way less data, way less data points. So it's easier for the algorithm to learn those longer term dependencies. At the same time, given we have sequences with less data, what this results in is a system that's computationally lighter than uh, when we use raw audio. Now, we don't just have advantages by using uh, spectrograms for generation, we also have we also introduce other problems or challenges that we have to face. The most important one is that now, uh, given we have like a higher resolution with on the time axis with spectrograms, it's difficult to capture local patterns because we don't really have that information because that gets smoothened when we transform uh, the sound from a waveform into a spectrogram. Now, it turns out that all the features connected with audio fidelity are oftentimes um, live at a local level. So they're very local. So what this means is that when we generate audio or sounds from spectrograms, the audio quality is not the greatest. We still have like to find ways of like optimizing the audio fidelity. Now, another problem that we have is that of phase reconstruction, which can be problematic. Now, I don't want to bother you too, mu too, too much about what uh, like phase is, but basically you have to think that when you have an audio signal, you have like one, one element that you have with it, like is its phase. And when we do, when we move like to a spectrogram, and then we feed the spectrogram into a network for training, what we usually do is we get like the magnitude of power spectrogram, which basically 
removes information about face. So we, we don't train on face. And when we want to then go back from a magnitude or a power spectrogram back to uh, a, uh, a, a waveform, then we have to reconstruct that face. And it's not, this isn't an easy process. There are like a few workarounds, but it's not an easy process. So I don't want to get into the details here about like face, as I said, again, if you want to learn more, I have like this video that explains all you need to know uh, to understand what I've said. I've seen on the Sound of AI Slack channel that many of you guys are familiar with male frequency sexual coefficients or MFCCs. And this is like another type of feature that is often used for uh, music or audio analysis. Now, the question you may have is, can we use MFCCs for sound generation? Well, it turns out you really can't do that. And why can't you do that? Well, because you have like a situation that's similar to that of a, a spectrogram. So you start from a uh, waveform, then you extract the MFCCs, then you train your model on MFCCs. Then when you generate, you're going to generate MFCCs. But at that point in post-processing, you want to convert MFCCs back to a waveform. So you want to do this. You have your MFCCs and you want to convert them in a, an audio file, right? But that's problematic. We don't have like an easy way to get high quality um, transformations from the MFCCs back to audio. So yeah, unfortunately, MSCCs are not really that good for uh, sound generation or sound synthesis. Okay, now moving on to another aspect that's very important in sound generation systems. Here we need to talk about the different deep learning architectures that we can use for sound generation. And here we have like loads of different architectures. What I want to list here are the ones that are like the, the ones that I think like pop up the most in research. So these are GANs or generative adversarial networks, autoencoders, variational autoencoders or VQ variational autoencoders. And like this last uh, variational autoencoder flavor has been used by OpenAI for the jukebox uh, music generative system. Now there are a lot of like other architectures that we could list, but I think like this is like a nice like overview for now. Okay. The final point that I wanted to touch upon is the different types of inputs that we can use for generation. And here we have three categories, so conditioning, autonomous generation and continuation. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we can't have a model that does two of them or f even three or all, all, all three of them, right? But now let's try to uh, go into the details of each of these one. So, What's condition generation? The idea here is that you can pass to the network some information when you generate. It could be like a semantic tag. So like for example, give me a song in a Frank Sinatra style, but with a rock genre and with a happy mood. In order to have like this conditioning at generation time, you have to train your network uh, already like with uh, some form of conditioning so that the the network can learn to distinguish like for example different artists or different musical genres and different uh, moods and the output is always like a some form of sound okay so that's for conditioning what's ab ab what what about autonomous generation well in this case you have uh, a model that generates sound without any input. So this is the kind of like the wildest form of generation. It's the, the most free, the freest form of generation. Finally, you have continuation. And here the idea is that you have some form of seed. For example, it could be the, the start of a sentence uttered by a speaker. Then you use that a starting point and then you ask the network to continue that sentence or that musical passage. So that's continuation. Okay, now what are we going to build here in this series? Well, following our uh, taxonomy or way of categorizing uh, sound generation systems, we'll build a system that can generate music notes or perhaps some short music passages. I still haven't decided on this yet because I'm still like working on the code for this series, uh, but we, you may expect either of this. 
Then we're going to be using uh, spectrograms, but probably melt spectrograms. We are definitely going to be using um, a variational autoencoder and the generation will be fully autonomous. Cool. So what's next? So now that you have like a good overview of the sound generation uh, problem with all of the different approaches and the way of classifying different uh, sound generation systems, the next step is to start learning about autoencoders. So we'll learn about the intuition of behind autoencoders as well as the theory. So I hope you enjoyed this video if that's the case and please like leave a like and if you want to get like more videos like this uh, please consider subscribing if you're not a, a subscriber and i think that's all for today i'll see you next time cheers